gods and my gods. Do you or I know which are the stronger? HPPodcraft.com East of Suez, some hold, the direct control of Providence ceases. Man being there handed over to the power of the gods and devils of Asia, and the Church of England Providence only exercising an occasional and modified supervision in the case of Englishmen. This theory accounts for some of the more unnecessary horrors of life in India. It may be stretched to explain my story. That was the opening paragraph and epigraph of The Mark of the Beast by Rudyard Kipling. And you are listening to our coverage of it here on the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast. At hppodcraft.com. Paul McLean is the reader. That's right. I don't know if you've heard of him before, but uh, he does uh, the Yog Sothoth podcast, um, News from Dakotas and the Silver Lodge, and also is the producer of a novel called The Express Diaries, written by Nick Marsh. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in some cool Lovecraftian fiction... This book is, uh, got it. So go check it out. There'll be a link on our show notes. And thanks, Paul. Excellent job, as always, reading. This is our free show for February, which I don't know if everybody knows this, but is Werewolf History Month. What? Wait a minute. I thought it was Black History Month. Well, it's that, yeah, but it's also, or at least here at the podcast, it's also Werewolf History Month. And right. uh, <laughs> that's why we're doing Mark of the Beast today. And for the rest of the month, we're going to be talking about the novelette The Werewolf by Clemens Hausman. And all sorts of other good werewolfy topics. Just wanted to call out real quick that if you subscribe to our show, mm -hmm. we do one free show a month and then we do three others for subscribers only. We've just covered a bunch of stories uh, Lovecraft wrote when he was a kid with actually used an eight-year-old reader in one of them to cover that stuff. We also covered Lair of the White Worm, which we both hated. Yep. We talked about the fall of the House of Usher for a few episodes. Yeah. The Willows. The Great God Pan. The Monkey's Paw. The Upper Birth. The Yellow Hull Paper. And uh, The King in Yellow by Robert Chambers. So there's a lot of shows on there that if you subscribe now, you can listen to right away, as well as the next uh, couple of months, including Werewolf History Month. Also, I want to plug Deadbeats. It's our graphic novel, which ships worldwide for free if you go to bookdepository.com. And if you are in the UK, uh, Ian... Colbar, the artist, and myself, Chris Lackey, we are doing a signing at the York Traveling Man, and that is on February 9th, and we'll be there at 1 p.m. So February 9th, Ian and I will be there. There'll be some ukulele playing, maybe a little wrestling. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. It'll be a good time. Wrestling. Wow. Well, the last thing I want to plug before we jump into this story is uh, we used to offer two soundtracks that covered most of the music we use in the show. I finally made them available for sale. God. They're on Bandcamp, and it's we're going to link out to that from hppodcraft.com or from witchhousemedia.com. Uh, I've remastered all of the tracks. Oh, sweet. Both of those soundtrack albums, also I added three bonus tracks to each. What? So What? Over two hours of music. They're only $7 a piece. Let's talk about The Mark of the Beast. What was going on in the uh, the opening there? Well, in the opening there, that was they were talking about how east of the Suez, which is uh, a city that's on the Red Sea, there's no Christian gods. There's no providence, is mm -hmm. what he says. And this story takes place in India, which is kind of a, a godless region. And the only time God is ever in there, the Christian God, is when Englishmen bring it with them, basically. Yeah, it's a funny opening, I think. Like, it is. The English God has kind of made arrangements with some of the other gods. <laughs> It'll poke in occasionally to help you out, but it has limited it has limited powers in this jurisdiction. So the, narr the narrator continues. We don't ever get the narrator's name, so we don't know who no. he is. So we'll just refer to him as the narrator. He talks about it. he's got this buddy, Strickland, who's a cop mm -hmm. there in India, because this story takes place in India. And this guy, Dumois, who is an, a doctor, and they mm -hmm. all witness this crazy thing that happened. But uh, Dumois is now dead. Now, I thought that was going to play into the story, but I think he just means he has died since then because right. he, he doesn't actually die at the end of the story, which uh, kind of threw me for a loop. It's kind of cool. I think, yeah, the point is that there are fewer and fewer people who can relate this odd happening. Yes. Uh, the other character that gets introduced here is this guy, Fleet. Fleet comes, you know, he, he basically moved into India because he had inherited some land. Yep. Uh, and <laughs> you wrote here in your notes, he's a nice fat guy. <laughs> yeah. They just said he was a big, heavy, genial, and inoffensive man. But then right away you get something about his character. It said his knowledge of natives was, of course, limited, and he complained of the difficulties of the language, which is funny. I mean, you moved to India. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Come on. Uh, it's it's sort of like I hear people sometimes, why did all the signs have to be in Spanish? You know, around town here. I'm like, I don't know. That's such an odd thing to have occur in a city called Los Angeles. Right. <laughs> <laughs> why are you complaining? It's Southern California. It was it was settled by Spanish speaking people. This story 
focuses around the aftermath of a New Year's Eve party. Yeah. Where all of the uh, British soldiers and uh, officers and different people who are stationed in India who rarely get to hang out in British society. Normally yeah. they're around the natives all the time. Basically, they're all getting together at the police station mm -hmm. to get drunk and party, right? Yeah, on New Year's, yeah. And, and it's a bunch of white people they talk about. It's great mm -hmm. to actually be able to hang out with white people and be able to sing songs. You know, they sing Old Lang Syne and stuff and right. get really, really drunk. And Really eh, drunk. Yeah, really, really <laughs> drunk. The, that paragraph that describes the night is really a fun paragraph. I, I have to admit that some of the things go over my head. I don't know what some of the things are that he's referring to. Uh -huh. it, it, it's basically talking about how they're singing those songs and partying and that sort of thing. But the end of the paragraph runs off into this, you know, what happened after the party. But it looks at it from a life perspective. It says some of us died. You know, some of us won medals. Some, And then the quote here, it says, some were married, which was bad, and some did other things, which were worse. <laughs> and the others of us stayed in our chains and strove to make money on insufficient experiences. And I just thought it was a really just great writing. Yeah. You know? And I think it sort of sets them all up to be buffoons. You know, I think Fleet is the primary buffoon in the story. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> the narrator's point of view on everybody seems to, sort of to be not a favorable one. No. No. So Fleet uh, gets super drunk at this party. Like he gets. Yeah, they uh, chronicling the stuff that he drank over this night is. I, I want to throw up just reading this. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. So he gets so drunk that they decide that they're going to take him home. Well, not mm -hmm. to his house because his house, house is pretty far away. They're going to go to Strickland's place and crash there for the night. On the way home, they went by this temple of a monkey god called Hanuman. Hanuman. I think it's pronounced Hanuman. Hanuman. I'm not sure. Okay. And the narrator says, I, I'm always nice to apes because monkeys and things, because I think that if I was out in the wilderness and I needed some God favor from not a Christian God, because he's in this godless place, that yeah. Hanuman would be a decent God. I think that is solid reasoning. <laughs> Very solid reasoning. So uh, on the way back, Fleet is so drunk, he decides he's going to go up and um, be rude. There's a ceremony going on in the middle of the night. And he mm -hmm. takes his cigar and puts it out on a statue of Hanuman. And he says, she that mark of the beast. I made it. Isn't it fine? And they're yeah. like, whoa, dude, what are you doing? Yeah, it's it, it's funny. It says Strickland has a weakness for going among the natives. He's particularly sensitive. He knows that this is blasphemy that's occurring right now. Yeah. And Fleet is so drunk. He's just sat down after doing this. He's not moving after he ground his cigar into this image yeah. of the god. And then something crazy happens. <laughs> then, without any warning, a silver man came out of a recess behind the image of the god. He was perfectly naked in that bitter, bitter cold, and his body shone like frosted silver. For he was what the Bible calls a leper as white as snow. Also, he had no face, because he was a leper of some years standing, and his disease was heavy upon him. We two stooped to haul Fleet up, and the temple was filling and filling with folk who seemed to spring from the earth when the silver man ran in under our arms, making a noise exactly like the mewing of an otter, caught Fleet round the body and dropped his head on Fleet's breast before we could wrench him away. Then he retired to a corner and sat mewing while the crowd blocked all the doors. The priests were very angry until the silver man touched Fleet. That nuzzling seemed to sober them. Some more nuzzling going on there. Yeah, but uh, once again, the the verb is very creepy in this context. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's super creepy. This guy had no face. This it just really gripped me at this point of the story because you know that that there's some kind of werewolvery is going to happen. But the monster in the story is this. It's the Silver Man. It's not what happens to Fleet necessarily. And then after that happens, the uh, kind of the high priest of the of the group says take your friend away he has done with Hanuman but Hanuman has not done with him and then they all just kind of part and let him go so Strickland is very angry about this but Fleet oh you know he's God. too drunk to even know he's what too drunk happened. to care yeah he doesn't know what's going on but as they're making their way along he, he's sniffing the air and saying can't you smell the blood There's so much blood it's like a slaughterhouse nearby is what he says why is the slaughterhouse so near here that doesn't make any sense and they're like mm -hmm. what is he talking about after they put they get to Strickland's and they put Fleet to bed and have a you know morning whiskey <laughs> as you do as you do just to polish off the night they're talking about it and Strickland's saying I don't that was really strange. Those people should have ripped him to pieces for yeah. for blaspheming the god. Should have stabbed him. He would have should have been stabbed and he would have been justified because I believe mm -hmm. there's a, a law specifically that says that 
um, in India, you can't do that. And if you do that, you, you can go to jail. But once the silver man did what he did, everybody was cool, which is super, super creepy. The narrator splits at 7 a.m. after they have their whiskey and he he rises about one and he goes back to Strickland's to see how Fleet's doing. Before he left, by the way, he saw Fleet just kind of lying on a side, scratching his left breast like <laughs> like a dog or something. Mm-hmm. When he comes in, Fleet's awake and he's eating and he's yelling at the cook because the, the meat that he's eating has been cooked too long. He wants something more raw. And he's also complaining about a bite that he's scratching at. Yeah, on his chest. He goes, well, what's with these mosquitoes? They keep just biting me in one specific location. And they're like, what do you won't put up your shirt? Let's take a look at this bite. And they look at it and it looks like a, a black leopard spot. Like it's a circle with tiny with smaller spots around the outside of it. And and mean, meanwhile, he's ordered these underdone chops. And when they come, he's just eats them like an animal. He like rips into them and is snarling and free. And this is freaking out our narrator and Strickland. It made me laugh in that paragraph when after he's eaten and he, you know, he feels stupid for having bolted those down the way that he did. Uh-huh. It says, uh, fleet interrupted by declaring in a shame faced way that he felt hungry again. <laughs> that made me laugh. Strickland says to the narrator, he goes, Hey man, would you mind staying tonight over, staying over at my house tonight? And he's like, I live like a mile away. It's there's, nothing to worry about like why why do you want me to stay here and he goes well maybe we should go for a ride go to go see the Mm -hmm. horses so they go into the stables because they have horses there and strickland's super into his horses the horses wig out they just go crazy and he's never seen them like that then they all leave and then fleet stays outside and the narrator and strickland go back in and the horses calm down and he goes they're they're afraid of fleet Right. There, this Strickland is so upset. There's a characterization of him here that made me laugh out loud when he says he took his mustache in both fists and pulled at it till it nearly came out. <laughs> just imagining that. How painful would that be? This guy just going, ah! <laughs> he's so mad. He's so mad he's pulling on his own mustache. But when they, they go out and they say, Fleet, you're scaring the horses. Fleet goes, no, no, no. My horse, it loves me. I don't know what you guys are talking about. So he goes in to show them that his horse loves him and, the, and his horse freaks out. And just bolts and runs and gets out of there. Yeah. And then Fleet just goes, eh, whatever, I don't care. <laughs> Who cares about that horse? And Strickland is saying, you know, I, don't, I really don't like what's going on here. And uh, there's a funny line in here where the narrator says, yeah, well, he eats like a savage, but that could just be that he lives out in the hills out of reach of society as refined and elevating as ours. <laughs> like, <laughs> is, you know what I mean? It's yeah. that same kind of thing where he realizes that they're both idiots, too. Yeah. Somehow. I don't know. That's It's such a. You, it really brings across this character, this guy. Um, it's such good writing. It is. Strickland has some sort of suspicion about what's going on. He's afraid to talk about it yet, but he, as you say, he wants the narrator to stay. Fleet wakes up and he wants more chops and <laughs> he's still hungry. He still wants this raw meat. And they go, hey, you know what? Chill out. We're going to go out to dinner. Let's all go out to dinner. Of course, the horses freak out and won't let Fleet on. Fleet says, I'm just going to stay here. You guys go out. They go back out to the town by the temple of the, the monkey god again and they see mm-hmm. that silver man out there and he's making his creepy little otter noise it's funny because strickland says he's not one of the normal priests and i really want to kick that guy's ass i'm paraphrasing here that's what he says he says i think i should particularly like to lay my hands on him is what he says when they get back to strickland's the place is all dark and then fleet sort of stands up out of some bushes <laughs> <laughs> like he's been out in the garden doing something and like, go, what, what are you doing? He's, oh, I'm out here gardening. You know, the smell of the earth is really great. I, I just want to go for a long walk all night long. And they're going way. This, these, this is not, things aren't going well. You got to come in for dinner, but fleet, he doesn't want any lights on. You know, he's, his eyes are sensitive. Yeah. There's a fun, there's a quote here. It says fleet came. And when the lamps were brought, we saw that he was literally plastered with dirt from head to foot. He must have been rolling in the garden. He shrank from the light and went to his room. His eyes were horrible to look at. There was a green light behind them, not in them, if you understand. And the man's lower lip hung down. That image of him, this guy, he's covered in mud, so he looks probably very inhuman, and there's something about his eyes. Like, he says that it was green light behind them, not in them, if you understand. Honestly, I don't understand. What does he mean by that? I just think it's descriptive. It's hard to concept- conceptualize, but it, it does leave you with this very creepy effect. It does. Absolutely. Something about a paragraph after that I thought was excellent writing as well. Um, a couple of paragraphs later when Fleet is hanging out in the bedroom while they're preparing dinner and they hear a wolf howl come from his room. 
People write and talk lightly of blood running cold and hair standing up and things of that kind. Both sensations are too horrible to be trifled with. My heart stopped as though a knife had been driven through it, and Strickland turned as white as the tablecloth. The howl was repeated, and was answered by another howl far across the fields. That set the gilded roof on the horror. So it was really nice. Really nice. And what is this? There's a howl coming from out. So obviously Fleet's in there howling, yeah. and it's being answered back by... Something else out in the yeah. in the woods. And when they come in to grab Fleet, he's he's kind of going out the window. Yeah, and he's snarling like a beast, and they just grab him, and they <laughs> tie him up. The narrator wants to say it's hydrophobia, which I guess is rabies, right? It's rabies, yeah. But he doesn't even get it out because he knows that that's probably not what it is. But they, they tie Fleet up, and they call for that doctor that was mentioned in the opening, Dumois. And, but Strickland says it's, it's not going to do any good, but you might as well call the doctor. And then they heard outside a mewing like a she-otter, and they think, mm-hmm. oh, it, that's got to be a cat, right? But they know it's not a cat. It's the silver man. The way they describe that mewing, I mean, it's such a specific verb, you know, mewing. They, they, it brings it up over and over and compares it to the mewing of an otter. In, an otter sounds somewhere between a bird and a cat. Here's a sample. Here's just something I pulled from YouTube of, of some otters mewing. Oh, Wow. And I think that a human making that sort of sound, it just makes, here's this guy who's completely naked and and horrendous. I think he's missing hands and feet and that sort of thing as well. And obviously his face is gone. And then he makes this noise that's so pathetic. It's it's pretty ghastly and very unnerving. Now, uh, Dumois shows up and he sees what's going on and he says, oh, no. And he, he says that he's never seen a man so unprofessionally shocked. Which I thought was, <laughs> which was mm. pretty good. He thinks it's definitely rabies and that he's going to die. Yeah, he's saying we've got to just let this uh, play itself out and then I'll call the time of death. And Strickland said, you know what? Get out of here and we're going to deal with this on our own. And Dumois is like, okay, sure. You know, whatever. Strickland thinks that this is happening too quickly. This has got to be, this is a curse. And then he hears that kind of mewing outside again. And he, he says, if this happens six times, I shall take the law into my own hands I, and I order you to help me, which I guess means Strickland is, since he's a cop, he's in some kind of position of authority and he can make him do that. Yeah, the narrator is like, uh, no, no, it's just a cat. It's, it's just a cat. Can't be that guy out there. <laughs> Meanwhile, Strickland's putting gun barrels into the into a fire, yeah. spreading twine out of a table, breaking a walking stick in two. He's sort of getting his plan together. And uh, he's saying, you know, we got to go out and catch him. He's got to be taken alive and unhurt. So Strickland has, he knows what he wants to do. And it's not sounding too good for the silver man. You know? <laughs> it's not. <laughs> and it was funny, Chris, because last episode, we had a long discussion about what does a curse mean? Oh, yeah. And I said, yeah, but I've never heard of a story where somebody was cursed and the way to solve that curse was just go f- by go finding a guy and kicking his ass. And that's <laughs> and the that's plot exactly what happens of this story. story. <laughs> <laughs> so the guys go out to find the silver well, they, man. Yeah, they figure out that he's looping around the house and they're going to go hide in the mm-hmm. bushes and wait for him to loop around and they're just going to jump him. In the moonlight, we could see the leper coming round the corner of the house. He was perfectly naked and from time to time he mewed and stopped to dance with his shadow. It was an unattractive sight, and thinking of poor Fleet, brought to such degradation by so foul a creature, I put away all my doubts and resolved to help Strickland from the heated gum barrels to the loop of twine, from the loins to the head, and back again with all tortures that might be needful. Yeah, so they jump the leper, and he's stronger than they thought he was going to be, but they, they totally beat him down, and they win, and they tie him up, and they bring him inside. Yeah, it says several other things happened also, but they cannot be put down here. <laughs> so I, I, I like that he does that a few times as the story goes on. It's almost a Lovecraftian technique, although his writing style is so different. But oh, I'm just yeah. not going to mention some things so you can imagine what they are. But basically, they're torturing him. They've got the leper. That's what the whole heating the gun barrels are. And they torture him for hours. And eventually yeah. he gives in and he says, he'll if you let him go and quit torturing him, he'll take the curse off of him. And then he does it, which is kind of surprising to me, but... He goes through with it anyway. I, I mean, that whole scene really, um, I, I didn't understand what was going on for a moment when I was reading this. And then when I realized what they were doing, the scene really stuck in my brain. I just imagine this this guy who's already so diseased and he's the lowest of the low, you know, yeah. and they tie him down and just, he's mewing. He's not even talking to them while they just go to work on him. Making that noise. 
fleet over there has fainted from exhaustion because as the creature is mewing, he's responding with these bestial sounds as well. You know, it's this crazy thing that's happening while they rip into this poor creature more. The beast is getting more and more worked up and uh, it's a, it's a heck of a scene. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty disturbing. But at the end of it, he gives up. Mm-hmm. He takes the curse off of fleet and they give him a bed sheet and all the things that he touched because they don't want his leper filth on him. Yeah. And, uh, and he leaves. He just takes off. They stay awake, but in the morning, Fleet wakes up. He wakes up, and he thinks it's New Year's Day. Yes. He has no memory of anything, and that, that mark on his chest is gone as well. And they yes. have to say, hey, no, it's actually the 2nd of January. You've been out for a long time. And then they don't tell him. They don't really tell him what happened. No, but Strickland goes to the Temple of Hanuman or Hanuman to say, you know, apologize for what had happened. And everybody says, no, that never happened. So it's like, was that a dream, the whole thing? What 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 did happen? <laughs> it's yeah. really bizarre and strange. And so they just kind of uh, let it go. One other thing that he mentions is that it was this is a really bizarre thing. Fleet was getting dressed in the dining room and he sniffs a little bit. And then he says, you know, it smells doggy in here. You'd better keep those dog's ears out of here because it's it's it smells like a you know, it smells like a dog in here. And Strickland grabs a chair and just goes into this fit of hysteria. Yeah, he goes nuts. He's super angry at him because of everything fleet has put him through (laughs) and all the crap that they've had to deal with and he just goes nuts he goes nuts and the narrator too he goes i laughed and gasped and gurgled just as shamefully as strickland while fleet thought that we had both gone mad we never told him what we'd done and it's such a great moment because they're just both they're going (laughs) and fleet has no i I mean he's in the flip position that they were in he must think that they're possessed or something like that and at the end it says uh, some years later when Strickland had married and was a church-going member of society for his wife's sake, we reviewed the incident dispassionately, and Strickland suggested that I should put it before the public. I cannot myself see that this step is likely to clear up the mystery, because, in the first place, no one will believe a rather unpleasant story, and, in the second It is well known to every right-minded man that the gods of the heathen are stone and brass, and any attempt to deal with them otherwise is justly condemned. That's the end of the story, man. That's what a cool, weird tale, man. It's just, it's so great because nothing is really explained and Mm -hmm. and nothing crazy supernatural happens. Like nobody's laser beams don't shoot out of anybody's eyes or anything like that. It just... Is that the bar for something being supernatural? Lasers shooting out of... Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> that sounds a little, yes, it is. It left me with a lot to think about because the person who this all happens to is a completely unsympathetic character. He deserves the punishment. He deserves to become a beast. Well, I don't know. That might be a little extreme. You know, like for I think disgracing somebody's god shouldn't you shouldn't be condemned to death for it. Well, okay, that's true. But he, you, you do see that he's responsible for being punished. I guess nobody deserves to be, I guess, death. But the he's the one that committed the offense. He did, and all of this torture is done to save him. It's just the morality of it is very strange. Yeah. On the one hand, I feel like the narrator is saying, "Well, you know, these natives are crazy. It's a hell out in India, and they're crazy pagan gods. And look at the way that they commune with the, the supernatural." And there's a part where they're torturing the silver man, where he says, "I understood." Then how men and women and little children can endure to see a witch burnt alive. Yeah. He's got a hatred for this pathetic creature. Yeah. But then some of the framing of the characters, it seems to make them out to be complete buffoons. And you wonder, is the silver man really the hero of the story? Well, I I think that's what makes it so good is the ambiguity of it. Like, who's right here? We don't know. It's just kind of one of those things that happens. There's no black or white in, I feel like, in nature. There really isn't. And in the story, there isn't either. Like, I, I think that the obviously that fleet was wrong and what he he done to them, but also I felt like the silver man's punishment was way too severe for what had happened. True, yeah, I think it keys into the law of nature. You know, if you're the alpha male among the wolves and one of the wolves acts out, you punish that wolf. There's no yeah. right or wrong about it. Blowing that up to any, it doesn't have to be British imperialists. It could be. Um, colonial Americans versus Native Americans. Any domineering society over a Native population could work with this type of story because it's sort of law of nature blown out. There's no morality to it. There's just one stronger animal. Yeah. Keeping another one down. The silver man acts out and then they torture him for it. You know, they have to Which show. Which I think is way 
more severe than than his crime. You know, like they keep right. upping the severity of the crime. First, the silver man does something which I think is unjust to uh-huh. Fleet. And then I think that what they do to the silver man is unjust. So who's right? Who's wrong? I, I, I don't know. Everybody's wrong. Everybody's wrong. And in the end, they walk away knowing their place once again. That's what makes the story good is that mm-hmm. <laughs> they're well, I mean, um, besides the writing and the, the ideas behind it. I recently um, picked up and this was before I even knew we were going to do the story for the show, a book called Tales of Horror and Fantasy, mm-hmm. or Rud- Rudyard Kipling's Tales of Horror and Fantasy. It's a curated correct collection of all of his uh, horror fiction and weird tales. And there's an introduction by Neil Gaiman where he talks about how earlier in his career he had listed in an interview Kipling as one of his favorite authors. And he had gotten an angry letter from some guys who said, how could you possibly have him as your favorite author? Because he was a fascist and he was racist and all of these types of things, you know, mm-hmm. and, 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 and even though it was clear, they had never really read Kipling. They had just been kind of instructed to f- feel this way. Yeah. And in that intro, Gaiman wrote something that I thought kind of applied to the maybe how we feel about Lovecraft, where it yeah. said it says, in truth, Kipling's politics are not mine. But then it would be a poor sort of world if one were only able to read authors who expressed points of view that one agreed with entirely. It would be a bland sort of world if we could not spend time with people who thought differently and who saw the world from a different place. Kipling was Kipling was many things that I'm not, and I like that in my authors. Well, thank you, Neil Gaiman. That's a that's a nice yeah, way to say it. <laughs> that's pretty good, absolutely. And I do think that that sort of relates to Lovecraft. I mean, he was from a different time, in a different place, where everything was different. That's interesting mm-hmm. to me. It doesn't mean that. I, I agree with everything that he says or thinks or does, but I don't agree with everything that anyone says. You can't agree 100% with anybody. No, but exactly. even if somebody has a completely insane worldview, if they write a good story, you can always uh, share that with them, you know. Yeah. Now, Lovecraft says in I'm not going to read the whole thing because he basically just summarizes the story in supernatural horror literature, saying that it's of particular poignancy when he's talking about Kipling's work. Uh, But the last sentence of what he says, he writes, the final defeat of the malignant sorcery does not impair the force of the tale or the validity of its mystery. Yeah. Yeah. Even though the heroes win out over the curse, it still uh, leaves you with a really depressed feeling. And the fact that nobody remembers it, the the priests at the temple are like, that never happened. It's it's so bizarre. It's like, did they alter reality in some way by by defeating this thing? Was he never there? Did they never actually go? Was that all a dream? I thought it was more that they had uh, the silver man came back and said this. He he's the one that told them this never happened. Don't talk about it. They took you know because they tor- <laughs> they tortured him. You know he had to kind of wipe it away that the event had ever happened. Otherwise, did they? I mean, is that it? Because if I was tortured by some people, I would go back to my temple and say these guys tortured me. We got to curse them all. Well, then you're talking about an Indian uprising, which did happen a few times. <laughs> <laughs> and and much like War of Resubjugation and at the Mountains of Madness, it didn't go very well for them. Right. Well, but I'm just saying that I don't know if it's that uh, maybe that is what was intended by Kipling was that mm-hmm. the silver man went back and told them, OK, just forget about it. Or if right. like somehow it was erased from their minds. I have this very simplistic feeling about this, like it's almost a schoolyard story where you know, you're getting picked on by the bullies. And so you, the one time you stand up, they really beat your ass to let you know that you shouldn't have done that. Yeah. And that's really what, what happened. You know, Hmm. he, he fought back in his way and then they made sure he knew that they had martial superiority. Could be. That's an interesting view. Well, an interesting story. And I think we're definitely going to get some Kipling again on the schedule in the future because I really enjoyed this story. Oh, my gosh. Well, there's the one, the Phantom Rickshaw. It's just the name of that one. <laughs> that's a that's a quite famous one, actually. I, I've never read it. I think that's pretty up there. I mean, people know Kipling for the Jungle Book and uh, Gunga Din. I mean, we mm-hmm. had to read Gunga Din in college. But I, yeah. I'm not too conversant with most of his stuff, so I'm looking forward to digging into it more. Yeah, yeah, but we didn't really talk much about him, and I think we'll talk about him because we're sort of running out of time on this episode. But yeah. He was uh, born in 1865 and died in 1936, so he just died uh, the year before Lovecraft did. So he was yeah, around. Yeah. He was around. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, I think he might be the youngest recipient. He was the first English yeah. language recipient of it. Yep. Yeah, a little more bio maybe the next time we come around. But let's do the fan- sometime in the future we'll do the Phantom Rickshaw and we'll uh, sure we'll more absolutely. Bio. Well, next we're going to be at uh, Witch House Media on our subscribers only show, mm-hmm. doing The Werewolf by Clemens Hausman, which I'm really looking forward to. Just want to thank our reader once again, Paul McLean. Yes, Paul, thank you so much for your reading. And if you want to help him or support him out in any way, check out the Express Diaries, his book about uh, a Lovecraftian 
horror on the Orient Express. Don't forget to go see Chris at the York Traveling Man on February 9th. Ian Colbard will also be there. Yep. They'll be showing our book, Dead Beats, graphic novel, which you are, if you are in the States like I am, you can still buy it at bookdepository.com. It ships for free worldwide. And the last thing I want to say real quick is that the music is available. You can link out from these show notes to go to the Bandcamp page where you can buy it. $7 a pop. It's good stuff. 35 songs, man. Wow. <laughs> that's right. And uh, that's all we have for this week. I'm Chad Pfeiffer. I'm Chris Lackey, and you are listening to the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast. At hppodcraft.com. hppodcraft.com. Wow.